Welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. All right, here we go. What you think about Well, hi, everyone, and welcome back to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and if you liked our opening song, it's called Clarion Call by the Mark Arneson Band, and you can download that on any of your favorite music platforms. For those of you that are new, Alzheimer's Speaks is not just about sound bites. We want to we wanna talk with people in the trenches and deliver you sound news. So our goal has been from the beginning to raise all voices, big and small, from those diagnosed to those who are personally caring for a loved one, to business professionals in the industry, to advocates, researchers, and so much more. Today is a live show, so you can call in. That number is 323-870-4602. Again, that's 323-870-4602. Now, before I introduce our guest, I'm just gonna do some housekeeping. Um, And a few announcements here. One, I want to give a shout out to Dementia Map, our global resource directory. We would love for you to tap into that. If you haven't, it is free to use. You don't need to become a member at all. So there's no password or any of that messy stuff that I know people are getting really paranoid about getting hacked with. Um, You will find not only a resource directory with 150 different categories, but an events calendar, a glossary of terms, and a blog as well. For those of you who are businesses, we would love to have you join us. There is free and also two very economical programs uh, that we have that can help you there. And this includes people who have social media groups. We'd love for you to be part of that because that helps people um, significantly. So just go to DementiaMap.com. For more information, or you can always reach out to me at radio at alzheimerspeaks.com. I'd be more than glad to give you a tour, send you some information on how you too can participate. Now, locally here in Minnesota, I have a couple of groups that I want to tell you about. One is Arthur's Memory Cafe that is um, sponsored by Arthur's Senior Care. We meet virtually on the second and fourth Wednesday of each month at one o'clock central time. So that's two o'clock Eastern, noon mountain and 11 a.m. Pacific. If you are interested in joining, memory cafes are for the person with dementia and their care partners. Uh, But sometimes we have people come individually as well, but you're more than welcome uh, to become part of our group. And then, On the last Wednesday of each month from 10 to 11 o'clock at the Shoreview Community Center, I facilitate a group for Brookdale North Oaks, which is a kind of a caregiver connect group. And um, anyone is welcome to join us. You can um, register by calling 763-913-6140. That's 763-913-6140. 6140, and I would be more than glad to uh, to see you at our, our group meeting coming up. Also, there are two international conferences I would like to invite you to. One is the Plymouth International Virtual Dementia Conference, and their title is, and their focus on this, it's three days, is going to be about the challenges and solutions in working in a COVID world. And so it'll be October 27th, November 3rd, and November 10th. And um, I'll personally be speaking on the 27th. We'd love to have you join us for any portion or all of the above. That conference is free. And then the um, 
charity uh, research um, called Brace for Dementia is having a dementia uh, a Together for Dementia conference on November 2nd. Um, that one, there is a fee, but it is pretty minimal. I want to say it's 10 or $15. And they're going to have people from all around the world, just as the other one is. Um, but that'll be really interesting. They're going to have somebody from the Dementia Villages. Um, they're going to have um, an author an actress there who wrote Remember Me, Discovering My Mother as She Lost Her Memory, and um, and the founder of the uh, Dominican uh, Dementia Foundation as well. So, And that's just to highlight a couple of, of people um, on that. So we are going to hear from the Foot Bar Walker. If you haven't uh, checked this out, this is if you have anybody who is in need of a walker, this is the one to recommend. Um, it really helps reduce injuries in the person utilizing it and those that are caring for them. So as soon as we come back from this commercial, we'll introduce you to our guest today. Introducing the life-changing Foot Bar Walker. I'm Peggy from Danville, Kentucky, and I'm 91 years old. The Foot Bar Walker revolutionized my care of George. The saving that I made from having to put him in a nursing home came to about $192,000. The foot bar walker opens and closes just like a standard walker. The only thing that is different is the top bar and the foot bar. Does that ever make a difference? Does someone you love use a walker? Do they struggle to get up from a seated position? Are you a caregiver dealing with physical pain and stress as you help your patient? The foot bar walker was designed to assist not only the patient, but also the caregiver. Patients have more control standing up, and no lifting from the caregiver is required. See how it works at thefootbarwalker.com. That's the thefootbarwalker.com. Peggy, would you recommend the foot bar walker? Do I ever? I would not be in the health that I'm in today at this age had it not been for the foot bar walker. And you can go to Dementia Map and actually take advantage of a discount that they have. You can get that walker now with the discount for $199.99. So check that out. It's absolutely fabulous. So today we're going to be talking about hospice and palliative care and, and veterans benefits and care here on Alzheimer Speaks Radio. And I'm thrilled to have my Shannon with us. She is the CEO of American Medical Home Care Alliance and Hospice and Palliative Care. Um, they go by AMHA. And she's also the founder and um, CEO of the Veterans Alliance. And her company believes in providing quality services, that that truly is the heart to everything that they they do when it comes to caring for their patients, if they're in a home, or if they're providing staff to those who live in a community. They are also very, very committed to recruiting, hiring, and training experienced healthcare professionals. So today we're going to find out all about their services. So welcome, Mai. I'm thrilled to have you with us. Hi. Thanks, Lori, for having me. Well, this is such an important topic. I, I really believe strongly that people need to get educated in end of life and benefits that cover and what this all means and when to be able to tap into it, because I think so often people tap into some of these services way too late. But before I get into my whole line of questions, I always like to mm -hmm. ask each one of my guests if they have been personally touched by dementia in their own family or circle of friends. I have. Um, I took care of my mom and my dad, and my dad was um, in the last four years of his dementia, um, I you know, we, when I say we, my my kids and my husband at the time, um, it was a full time, twenty four hour job that we had to take shifts on because his his Alzheimer was just uh, it was just getting so bad towards the last uh, four years of it, and and you know I I totally get how stressful it is, and and people always tell me that. Um, I'm here as a daughter or a son or a wife. I never thought I would be a caregiver as well. And and so those those uh, those kind of those kind of conversations are pretty pretty common, um, you know, in what I see. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Now, um, Maya, I believe you are Asian descent, and one of the things that I, I wanted to um, ask you first is really talking about, do you see cultural differences out there um, when it comes to end of life? Because I know I do. Yeah, yeah. There is, and every culture has their own belief in health care in general, not just end-of-life care, just health care in general, I think. And some um, are very open to any type of treatment, and I, I say hospice and, and palliative care is considered a treatment plan, too. It's not just giving up at all. So certain cultures are more uh, open to discussing um, hospice and palliative as a, a form of treatment and, and care for for their their loved ones as well as just the family support um, and it's huge differences. Um, I I think the most difficult one that um, even I'm having to deal with is the Asian cultural community of how they feel about supportive care when when their family member has a a terminal, or even just multiple chronic conditions that they need support on. Um, down to the veterans, there's probably the most non-compliant um, patients we have, but the most interesting for sure. And then, you know, of course, we um, there's different culture in the Hispanic and, and how they feel about that as well. So, absolutely, um, if you don't understand cultural, it's definitely going to harm. Um, the care for that patient and, and being able to reach and inside that family and, and determine what those needs are because they're just not very open um, in discussing them. Well, and I think, too, you add on to that um, generational differences in terms of what people believe in, if it's Eastern medicine, Western medicine, no medicine <laughs> at all. I mean, there's, there's a really... Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, I, we really have to ask and and listen uh, to what somebody, in in my belief, to what somebody wants um, and what's going to make them feel comfortable, you know, later in life. Let's talk about hospice and palliative care. First of all, what are they? Because I think there's so much misconception wrapped in both of those terms. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it, it's misconception and confusion because Medicare uses them so interchangeably as well as the hospital system. And so uh, there's just hard clarification. But hospice typically um, is the end of life, um, six months. Um, but, you know, nowadays it's, it's not just that six months at all. People come off of hospice when they become stabilized, and, and that's what hospice does, you know. When you have that supportive services and when you just eliminate all the extra stuff that people are adding to care, um, people tend to become more stabilized. And so hospice for Medicare's uh, terminology is the last six months, um, and I always kind of laugh at that because who who really has that predictive, uh, you know, uh, you know, gift of, of determining when life ends and and when you should uh, be used in hospice. And then palliative is more of um, I, I see it as um, almost a continuum of care, a coordination of care, so that. Um, you can coordinate from your primary care to your aggressive uh, treatment to home health or different therapy. I think palliative is that that cusp where you're not sure where you're going to teeter at, and that's where palliative is important in, in coordinating that so that you can teeter on the positive instead of, um, you know, the negative side of, of um, you know, treatment. Well, those are great definitions. Um, one of the things that I have noticed is doctors have different beliefs wrapped around these services as well. I yeah. mean, some are some mm -hmm. like are like you need to get into this right away, and others like like nope, you don't need it. I'm not referring. Yeah. And I yeah. just That's... that just throws me for a loop on that. It's like why would you not refer people 
do they not, do you think yeah. they don't understand or they just don't want to get involved in that step? Yeah, it is. You do have two wings on it. You have um, the left hand saying, no, I can't give up on my patient at all. My duty is to do everything I can for this patient. And then you have the other side of it who says, um, I am doing everything for my patient. And by doing everything, it means I have to look at the family and the whole unit and the whole circle of care and determining um, what is enough and and to make sure my patient understands, um, you know, what's reasonable and what's, uh, you know, what what they're able to do and what's their expertise. And sometimes it's hard for doctors to say, hey, I'm not an expert in palliative and hospice care. Let me get someone who is and, and to discuss options and to see if it's something that, um, you know, that fits in, in their treatment plan. So it is. And it's frustrating for me, and I think in hospice um, industry in general, is that I don't think hospice um, should be controlled by one physician at all. This needs to be uh, a collaborative um, decision between the family, giving the family all the information and the patient, and then all the expert providers so that um, everyone, they can give all the information, and, and it's, it's um, informed decisions that the patient is making instead of a, a, a biased opinion from a physician on how they feel about something. So it is very frustrating because, um, you know, patients and family um, deserve those benefits, and they paid for it all their life, and then to wait until the last couple of days to benefit from it, they say you don't really understand the benefit of hospice until you've been on hospice for at least 90 days and and see, you know, what it is that's so unique about um, the care and that, um, you know, it's, gosh, it's just so critical that, um they don't come in in the last couple of days because then everyone's rushing around and no one sees the benefit of it at all. No, oh, I agree. You know, I, I to me it seems like, and I could be way off on this, but when they refer to a neurologist, they refer to a, you know, whatever it might be, a heart specialist, I, there's, uh, it's, a, it's a different, they look at it differently. It's like, well, that's another per, uh, this is how I perceive it, that they look at it, that that's another professional in my industry on my same level, and it's a special category, so it's okay. But when it comes to referring to uh, hospice and palliative care, it, to me sometimes I almost feel like they look at it like a downward move versus mm-hmm. a lateral yeah. specialty, and I think that does such a injustice to people and their quality of life. And I I wish there was almost a mandate um, that this is done um, that, and and that it should be talked about anytime is, you know, when somebody has like a chronic illness, I think there should be a door open sometime about hospice and palliative care almost in the beginning. So it's not so scary when they have to tap them in and tap into it because there's just so many people that don't understand it. And you had mentioned where, you know, some people go on hospice and then they they get kicked off because they've been proved. That happened with my own mother. <laughs> and she yeah. ended up living another, I want to say, three and a half years um, mm-hmm. because of yeah. the, the specialty services that she got. She It was almost like her soul reengaged. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. th- those extra uh, reaches and touches with her pulled her back in and um Mm -hmm. you know and then the next time she went on it it didn't last very long at all you know it was it was her time to go but you had also mentioned the support for the family and that's Mm -hmm. incredible and i think families don't understand how comforting that can be my neighbor just uh went on hospice and I remember, her, you know, his wife was, um, she was just exhausted. You know, she's running to the hospital back and mm-hmm. forth. They'd send him home. He'd be back. And it was just, it was so draining. And you could just hear the relief in her voice. And she said, 
you know, they're so good. I talk with them every day. And they've told me, don't call 911, you call us. And just, she said, they've drilled that into me. And she's like, I just know they're my point person. And, you know, I got so tired of calling and being put on hold or you're in the hospital and you're pushing the button and nobody comes, you know, with the staff shortages. All of that, it just, there was such a relaxation in the process. And granted, she doesn't want to see her husband pass, but it's much better for everyone to be calm in that moment instead of instead of anxious you know i think um that's the one thing i had the privilege of of, i don't know if it's privilege but it was nice that i had that difference my mom passing in the hospital where um, family weren't allowed to just, um, you know, have the meal, have everything where it's it's a relaxing atmosphere that family can visit anytime, and you can have those critical conversations at home. Um, But when you're in the hospital, it's hard to coordinate everyone um, with work schedule and being exhausted. And then you're having to deal with medical staff in and out of the room, and there's just, you don't have that feeling of intimacy or privacy at all. And then I went through with my dad being on hospice, and it was just planned out. It was as if someone wrote a roadmap for us, and we always had someone directing us of, here's what's going to come up next. And you are prepared because you know what coming up next so there isn't a fear it's kind of like when I went whenever I'm going to a dentist it's the fear of what they're going to be doing versus if they just told me okay I'm about to give you this shot and you're ready for it and you know what to expect so that fear of that care is taken away and that's what um, I was able to feel the difference of uh, my my mom's care in the hospital versus my dad's care at home, and um, having just this just everyone social worker, chaplain, nurses, someone helping with the personal care, just all of that just made it predictable, and that's what is nice because healthcare is so unpredictable, and it's so hard to understand the language of what the physician is trying to tell you because, you know, no one wants to be that person that um, has to sit down and explain what those prognoses are. And if you have someone there to say, hey, yeah, that's the prognosis and this is what we're going to do to support it and this is what mom needs or dad needs, it just makes it, um, it's almost like, um, I don't know, when you're really good at um, preparing for everything, but then at the end, you have no clue. It just has that anxiety that is taken away from you. And I think that's what you are trying to explain with your neighbor is that they went through it, they knew what to expect, they had someone to call and ask questions whenever something seems confusing for them or um, mom or dad that isn't acting right because of the disease process of what Alzheimer's takes us through. Um, it's it's just unpredictable. I mean, I remember one day waking up and and just feeling just so flustered with my dad of trying to get him cleaned up and ready for breakfast and then turn around, get ready for breakfast, and there he is, you know, um, you know, needing to be cleaned up again. And we do this you know, four or five hours before breakfast is actually served. Yep, yep. No, I I totally, totally get that. Well, let's talk a little bit about who should consider um, hospice and palliative care and maybe even talk about the order because, again, we always talk about hospice and palliative care, but it really is palliative care and then hospice in my mind. But maybe Mm -hmm. I'm wrong. If you Mm -hmm. can clarify that, that would be wonderful. I think it's interchangeable. Um, Yes, I think um, palliative comes first because palliative is that transitional period of determining which block that you need to be in. Um, Is it time to consider hospice? But um, it can be the other way around. When you're in hospice and you're doing so well, it's time for hospice to now decide, 
well, I don't want to throw them right back out in the community and not have any supportive services. So they transition into palliative before they may transition independently. So it's it's kind of, it goes both ways. Um, and to determine which one you qualify for first, I, I don't think, and you're, I don't think you can just determine on your own. It's time to actually ask the expert, you know. Um, ask, call hospice, call palliative, and ask them to come out and take a look at that, take a look at the medical history, and um, give them, you know, a, an opportunity to talk to you about, you know, what's going on with the family. And then they can make those determinations, and then talk, they're able to coordinate that with the primary care physician or whoever else you need um, if it's appropriate. I think it's it's too hard to determine on your own. And I think same thing with physician. I don't think they should determine it on their own at all. That's not something they deal with on a daily basis, um, multiple, multiple times a, a day. Mm -hmm. No, I, I totally agree. And I know that, um, I, you know, I should say I've heard that the requirements for hospice and palliative care have changed over the years. And yeah. and so mm -hmm. sometimes there can be misinformation that maybe a doctor or a nurse has just because that's, mm -hmm. not, that's not their specialty. So get connected. Mm -hmm. And I guess I would recommend if you're not getting the answer that you want, you know, you, you have the right to a second opinion and to, yeah. you know, yeah. talk with another doctor because do they – can they just call you up and talk to you, or do they have to be referred mm -hmm. um, through a doctor in order to um, no, get assessed? No. <clears throat> no, I think it's best that they just call and talk first um, because then they have the the general idea to go back to discuss with their, their doctor. Um, and it, it's a way of determining which hospice is going to be the right fit for you. Um, we don't expect to be the right fit for everyone, just like um, other agency. You have to have your niche, and you have to know what you're good at. And I think um, our niche has always been the veteran community and, and the cultural differences between our uh, Asian community and the care for palliative and hospice. Um, so definitely call and, and just ask some questions, get to know what the services are about so that then you can go back to your physician and, and have a, you know, a, an informed conversation with him. Well, that makes total, total sense. What, what exactly is covered under hospice and palliative care? Is it different for the two? There is. Um, Hospice is going to be completely paid by either insurance or, or um, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, um, and and palliative. It, it all depends. There's so many different programs, and and again, each hospice and palliative have their own different programs out there. But palliative typically are in conjunction with um, your physician, your primary care, and other uh, health care provider that is treating you for those chronic conditions. And palliatives typically are only billed uh, with the primary care physician and the home health care um, agency, as well as um, other, uh, other groups. Hospital may have their own palliative program. Uh, you know, assisted living facilities may have their own palliative program, and they're typically not billed to the insurance or Medicare at all unless, um, again, they're, they're the physician or, or the home health agency. So there's huge differences in billing-wise, but um, it, it's completely covered by insurance. And there's some palliative out there that I've heard um, where the, the patient – and family pay privately for their palliative services. And I would really, really uh, have everyone check into that what's covered because sometimes what they're billing you um, privately is already covered under your insurance. And you may be paying for services that you didn't know that's already covered by insurance. So, um, again, palliative is so broad, you really have to 
ask those questions of what is your palliative program and what's covered on it. Okay, well that's that's good to know. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, services themselves, I, and I'll give examples and, and see if these are still in existence. But I know for my mom yeah. when she when she was on hospice, um, you know there was a pastor that came in. She got music therapy. Someone came in to to help with bathing, even though she was in a nursing home. And the other thing that I want to mention too. And again, please correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of communities have their own services, and sometimes people almost feel forced to use those, but my understanding Mm -hmm. is they have a right to choose if they want to use that Mm -hmm. inside company or want to go elsewhere. Is that correct? Yeah, it's always about patient choice and family choice, and there are some facilities um, and it's understandable. They they pick who their preferred providers are because there's a good communication program um, and and they have great relationships to make sure those care are um aren't interrupted at all. But it's always patients' choice of who they want as their provider, just as if it's their choice of which physician they want to use. Hospice and palliative is exactly the same. And You know, the basic coverage, Laurie, is that, you know, Medicare has a general baseline coverage, which is you're going to have to provide the physician care, the nursing care, the CNA care, uh, the spiritual care, and the social worker care on it. And everyone understands that clinical care, but what they don't understand, I think, about the non-clinical care, which is so important in a hospice program, is that support. Um, So the social worker is responsible in making sure that um, the patient and family have complete access to all the community resources available out there. Um, That could mean um, group therapy, it could mean music therapy, pet therapy, it can even mean last wishes that they might want to have And those last wishes don't have to be anything extravagant. They can be, you know, I haven't talked to my daughter for 20 years because um, of whatever dispute. And they try to work through those things to make sure um, that patient has those last kind of internal conflict that's causing um, problems in in their their healing process, too. the spiritual side of it, well, when you're sick and you're in an assisted living, which, you know, we never think about, but there are some people that still would like to have church services and their 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 link come out and speak to them. They're, um, if they're you know, for the Asian community, it's, it's big in the Buddhist uh, monk and, and temple, and they're not able to go to temple. That's where our chaplain is able to coordinate to figure out what services that are needed at, um, you know, where you're at, where you're not able to go out and get those services. They bring the services to the home. Um, So it's, it's, it's every, like I said, every agency have what they're unique um, and what services are unique. Ours might be, you know, our veterans, our nonprofit organization where, we advocate for our veterans and we have close relationship with the VA so that we know if someone's needing aid and attendance, we know how to get that approved. If they need to get enrolled with the VA, how do they do that without going through a bunch of red tape and what is needed to get enrollment and how do I get qualified? So I think we are kind of, um, you know, that expert in, in in the veteran community and in our Asian community because of that. Okay, well, sounds good. Thank you for um, clarifying that. Let's talk about the difference between VA and Medicare hospice. I, I think a lot of people uh, didn't know there was a difference between those. I know, and, and it just amazes me that they don't, especially – social worker and case managers at facility and I said I tell them all the time when I when they're handing a referral and I said is this a veteran and it's no you know they don't know and I and I'm always the one telling them well based on the birth date they were drafted they didn't have a choice of whether 
they are veterans or not. And so the difference is it's just so huge. And, you know, the main thing is Medicare changed the rules on hospice in 2013. I think it was October 2013. And they retroactively changed it where hospice can only provide be provided in that six-month period of time. And then there's face-to-face rules to see if you continue to be um, to qualify for hospice care. So there's almost a limit on that time period, even though Medicare says there's no limit. You can use hospice as long as you want. That's not really true either, you know. There's a time limitation that Medicare created in 2013. Before that, people were able to be on hospice for years as long as they had chronic condition that was considered not curable at all. Um, and um, they also had, uh, they had to give up aggressive treatment. So for an example, um, the most common one is, um, let's say cancer. If you are on hospice for cancer, anything that's related to cancer, any treatment um, related to cancer, chemo, radiation, uh, you it wasn't covered so you had to make a decision do you give up on those aggressive treatment and enter into hospice or do you take the aggressive treatment which causes all these downturns of comes with chemotherapy that you need those supportive services but you you can't have you have to decide one way or the other that's medicare well, the VA was really great in that they said our veterans should not have to decide on what they need to give up to get the kind of care they needed. So that meant that if you were diagnosed with, um, I'm going to use lung cancer just because lung cancer month is coming up this November. If you were diagnosed with lung cancer, you can no longer have any type of therapy treatment related to that lung cancer if you wanted hospice. VA said, nope, you will provide our veterans with both. They're able to have aggressive treatment and that supportive treatment as well. And they didn't have a time limitation. There was a, hey, you're not declining fast enough in the six months period, so we need to kick you off of the program. The VA just as long as you have those conditions and as long as you're still needing supportive services, they're going to give us the authorization to continue giving care to that patient. I have one patient right now that um, he's just a, he's been on our hospice service for over five years now, and we wanted to take him off because we thought he was stabilized. He called the VA and said, "Hey, why are you ta- why are they taking me off? I don't." I still need supportive services. I'm still at a fragile state in my health care. And the VA told us, don't take them off, keep them on. So here we are trying to follow those rules to save money, but the VA is is just so great in that they they don't want our veterans to have to decide like uh, Medicare hospice has to decide. Oh, fantastic. That's I, I did not know that difference. Um, well, the and other that's... thing, Lori, I forgot to mention on the VA is, you know, Medicare doesn't provide caregiving services. The VA does. So, mm-hmm. um, and they're, it's completely free to our veterans. So they'll give them, um, they'll load them up with 480 hours of initial caregiving hours on top of hospice, on top of home health, on top of all their other aggressive treatment, on top of taking away all their co-pays and pharmacy. So there's just huge, huge differences that people aren't aware of because, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a big red tape and it's, it's a, a huge, um, you know, backup when they're trying to decide who qualifies for VA. Mm-hmm. I, I, and people always mistake it with, hey, I, I wasn't during wartime, so I don't qualify. Well, that's mm-hmm. a different criteria, and that criteria falls under aid and attendant. It doesn't qualify under the VA um, homebound status patients at all. So mm-hmm. I think the best thing is just, you know, talk to someone that's going to be able to distinguish different programs um, 
for you. And I, I think it's funny that even the VA uh, enrollment people don't realize how many programs they have that's, uh, <laughs> available as well. So, wow, uh, that's, so we're that's always fantastic. Arguing, no, you're mixing that up with another program. Uh, I think the other great one the VA has is their catastrophic priority grouping program. And, and people always tell me, oh, I, I, I was discharged from the military without any service connection. Well, that's one part of the, uh, you know, qualification. But as our veterans get older, things will happen to them. Even a car accident can leave someone paralyzed or um, anything that's unrelated to the military. If it's unrelated, they now get to enroll because of medical condition that has changed, you know, and they mm-hmm. keep mixing up. Enrollment keeps mixing it up saying, oh, no, that veteran doesn't qualify financially. And I have to go through the form with them and say, no, we're not looking at financial qualification. We're looking at medical qualification. And there's a total different qualification with the VA for medical as well. Wow. That's, that is great to know. I always, I loved, I love my job because I always learn more and more information all the time. <laughs> so it's really important that you hook up with, if you're a veteran, that you hook up with someone who really knows this stuff inside and out. And that might not always be the veterans agency, it sounds like. Um, <laughs> when it got, when no, it, but, yeah. but, you know, if that happens all over in all different types of industries, I mean, you just quite never, mm-hmm. never know with that. Now, one of the things I hear from people all the time, and again, I don't know if you hear this, but, you know, am I giving up going on palliative care and hospice? And, you know, what are my, what's my family, what's my family and mm-hmm. what's my friends going to think, you know, am I letting them down? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that is a, I think the number one question, well, I'm not ready to die yet. You know? mm-hmm. And I just have to kind of giggle at that because who is ever ready, you know, and we never want to give up at all. But I think you made a good point in the beginning. It's, you don't, you're not saying that you're giving up if you have lab work done or if you're going to a neurologist or a pulmonologist or any specialty at all. So why would palliative and hospice be any different? You're looking at other alternative methods. Um, if people are looking at holistic or um, they're looking at Western medicine versus Eastern medicine, it's all looking, if you can't get proper care if you don't educate yourself of what are available to me and am I able to qualify for those services. And I have people that want to get on palliative and hospice, and we have to say, no, you absolutely don't qualify versus people that really should be on and they're afraid to because they don't, they think that as soon as I sign on hospice, I'm going to die. I'm not ready to die yet. And it's mm-hmm. You went through that with your mom, and, and you know, it was you just have to be the type of person that's extremely open-minded about the care that you're receiving and what those goals are in that care. And is it realistic goals for everyone? Mm-hmm. Well, and, and is, it, is it meeting somebody's wishes? I mean, I've already talked to my Bye. daughter. You know, I'm I'm 62. I'm healthy, but I have told her already. You know, if and I could change my mind, but my mindset right now yeah. is if I get cancer, I don't know if I'm going to do a chemo and a radiation. I've seen too many people suffer and not have quality of life, and for me, quality of life is my number one thing. That that yeah. you know that is what I want everyone to keep in mind when it comes to my hair. And again, I could easily yeah. change my mind, but right now I've just been preparing her for that. Just like um, I'm talking about end of life wishes. I want to be cremated and she didn't want me cremated. She's like, I don't want to burn you. And I'm like, Danielle, for once in my life, let me be small. Come on. You know, I want to be cremated. This I tell like, my kids all the time, Lori, you can cremate me. Just make sure I'm dead first. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. You know, it's, it's, you gotta, and it goes back. I always, when I'm meeting with family, I, my number one question is always, 
what does your mom want? What does your dad want? What does your husband want? What are their wishes? And too many times family are caught up in what their perception of what being a good daughter, son, wife Mm -hmm. is supposed to be. They're supposed to fight for you. They're supposed to not allow you to give up. They're supposed to encourage you. But we have to look at, am I making them suffer? Am I going against their wishes at all? What are their wishes? What do they perceive as their quality of life? And and what do they want from their care? Um, I, you know, I'll share this, and I don't share it often, and, and that is I went through cancer, period. And I had to shut down everyone around my family because everyone has their opinion of mm-hmm. how care should be done. And if you don't if you don't follow what the the major mass follows of what those treatments are supposed to be, um, you're really you're really finding a treatment for everyone else and and you're trying to please everyone else. And I I didn't go through chemo. I didn't go through all the aggressive treatment because I didn't want to look and feel miserable um and what I witnessed from other patients at all. I wanted it to be different. And Mm -hmm. my perception is my body is already being attacked by the virus. Um, And it's already, my immune system is already weak. Why am I doing everything to make it even weaker? Um, Just to kill this little part of the cell that's attacking my body. It made more sense for me to look at alternatives and to find out what I can do to increase my immune system to fight that off. Um, Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that find different alternatives for for cancer or even Alzheimer's. You know, we can't can't eliminate it, but we definitely can understand it, and we can kind of sway with, you know, the ups and downs of Alzheimer's and adapt to it so that um, it's manageable. And, you know... I'm grateful that I didn't follow the math and and didn't follow the advice um, and 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 did therapy and treatment my own way and I think that's what love is. That's what you can provide for your your dad and your mom. Find out what the wishes are um, and and you know take away expectation of what you have inside and allow them to go through that journey and and not force it upon them. Mm-hmm. Yep. No, I, I totally agree with you there. In fact, I'm going to give a plug for Compassion and Choices. Um, they, you know, are all about end of life choices, but they actually have a healthcare directive that you can fill out specifically for dementia. But really, it applies to a lot of things that can happen to us. And it says not only if I have this, but it al- allows you to make combinations of certain things and what you want to happen. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not diagnosed, but I easily could be, you know, my mom had it. Mm -hmm. Um, None of us know Mm -hmm. if we're going to get it, but I, I, and I, and I went through the whole thing and I didn't save the dang thing when I went to print it. So I have to get back in there and do it again, but I was really impressed and it's free of charge. And it's just stuff we should all think about. Actually, when we're 18, we should be teaching our children about powers of attorney and end of life because we all know someone Mm -hmm. who's lost a child you know, somebody in a car mm-hmm. accident, all kinds of fluky mm-hmm. things happen. And mm-hmm. we, we, we really got to get past this being scared of dying. We all know we're going to die, you know, so why mm-hmm. do we think if we don't talk about it, it's going to be just fine? You know, that, to me, that makes absolutely zippo sense at all. Well, this has just been a wonderful conversation. You have given us so much information. We have about 10 minutes left. I can't believe how fast the hour flies all the time. (laughs) Um, Were there any other benefits, like for the vets, that you wanted to mention? I know you highlighted a few. Was there there anything else? Um, Otherwise, then I want to get into, and, and I think it's been pretty apparent, but I'll have you summarize how your company is different. And I think you've just done a beautiful job talking about so many things that so many others don't talk about in and of itself. But first, Uh if there were any other benefits for VA, um, most common or really uncommon that you wanted to highlight, and then we'll get into the differentiation. 
I think um, the main thing uh, with the VA is people are so um, they're so into the, the the bad of what's going on right now, which is aid and attendant. Everyone beats aid and attendant to death, and it discourages veterans because um, it now creates this myth of well, if I wasn't in a war area, I don't qualify for the VA. Um, that's not true. The VA has about 130 different programs that you can qualify for. So because you didn't qualify for aid and attendance, um, you may qualify to get your priority, catastrophic priority upgraded to a four or five, which allows all these other services as if you were service connected. You know, I talked about the caregiving, I talked about pharmacy, um, home health and physical and occupational therapy is important to talk about because that's a huge difference um, between that and Medicare. Um, Medicare views it as intermittent care, meaning we're going to give you some therapy so that you can get onto a program and work out on getting those strengths built up on your own. But the VA is, again, it's unlimited. If, the, if Medicare now ended your physical therapy and you feel like you still could benefit, that's when they need to talk about enrollment, getting their priority catastrophic upgraded so that they can continue those therapy. And the VA contracts multiple community specialists like uh, the Barrel Institute for Alzheimer for stroke victims. Um, they um, contract with uh, MD Cancer Center of America and Ironwood. So, they are not, people say, I don't trust my care with the VA. Well, you don't have to. They have specialty community providers that you can choose from to provide those kind of care for you. Um, I think the biggest concept is um, it's a mess as a VA. I don't want to work with a VA. The VA doctors aren't as great as my docs. Um, you can continue with your doctors and you can continue with those specialty um, once enrolled. There's, there's people contracted that you might be surprised. It's kind of like insurance, you know, and you'll be surprised of who's involved with the VA care. So I think that's uh, one of our biggest uh, niche there. Um, and I don't want to go away without talking about the Asian community and, and the language barrier and, and just by the language barrier, how that causes such uh, disconnect in care and, and miscommunication of what services are offered. And, um, you know, we have that, that language of the, the Vietnamese language. Um, we have the Spanish language for all of our Hispanic um, community as well because, um, you know, that's, I think language is the biggest barrier in, in receiving care. Oh, I would definitely agree with you there. And that's one of the things that I loved in, in terms of even your contact information. You have different phone numbers people can call. So they can reach out to you um, for veterans. Uh, they can reach out to, it looks like, Pam for Vietnamese. And then you've got Mike and mm -hmm. Rebecca um, on your team as well. And all those phone numbers are listed. And um, they can also go to your website, um, which mm -hmm. is amhascottsdale.com. But you also are having, uh, you're expanding, if I'm not mistaken, too, into some other states? Yeah, yeah. So um, I used to then partner with a partner that we had, uh, we were in five different states. And so once I separated, um, I created uh, my own expansion. So we're right now in Tucson and here in the Phoenix area. Um, I think by the, hopefully by the beginning of the year, we can begin operation in our Denver area. Um, Dallas is a little bit, you know, uh, out in the horizon a little bit. I think the first quarter of uh, 2022 um, will be up and, and going. Um, and the problem, um, Lori, isn't, um, isn't the operation, it's staffing right now. Staffing is just making it difficult for everyone to make sure that we have a stable environment for our patient and our staff to work from. And until that becomes stabilized, um, 
we just don't want to even jeopardize anyone's care um, until that becomes stabilized with a, our government with the whole vaccine situation going on right now and, and um, all of our health care uh, providers being mandated to uh, be vaccinated. And so it's, it's causing a little bit of an uproar right now. Well, even in the communities, it is. Um, you know, I was talking with somebody the other day, and they said, we're full, but we're not. You know, we, we're under capacity, <laughs> but we can't take mm-hmm. any more people. So right now, for the staff we have, we're full. And, mm-hmm. and companies yeah. are being very cautious because, of course, they, they don't want to be liable for not being mm-hmm. staffed properly. So I totally, totally mm-hmm. Um, understand that and appreciate that. And, you know, hopefully um, that will change, you know, in the future yeah. here. One of the things, um, and again, we only have a few minutes left, but I'll just mention this. One of the things I would really like to see is is staffing, um, people targeting people who work care partners, because a lot of them out there are interested. They feel like they've developed a skill and want to be able to help, um, but they don't know where to go. They don't know what to do, and they're kind of lost after their loved one passes and stuff. And, and there are some that want to just hit the road and run and never go back you know, on that journey at all. <laughs> but others really get how much help families need and are really, really interested in stepping in and stepping up Um you know, mm-hmm. to help solve that problem and stuff, too. Any last words of wisdom? We've got about th- uh, three minutes left, but uh, thank you so much. This has just been a wonderful conversation, Mike. Thank you, Lori. Um, last words of wisdom. Hmm. I don't know if I have too much wisdom <laughs> at all to, to give you a last word of wisdom, but, um, you know, I, I, I'm just grateful that I'm able to share some of um, you know the misconception um, of our our care, and and hopefully it'll it'll open some conversation up um, with your listeners, and and at least um, for them to do some discussion with their family of of, of what they're needing and and uh, getting that help. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Well, um, you know, it's too bad we didn't have some callers, but they might have been just sitting at home taking notes, too, (laughs) with all the great information that you were given, uh, giving us. But I I know a lot of people listen after the fact, too. And again, um, what would be the best phone number for them to call? We have it listed on the radio page. We've got it on the blog and all of that. But is there is there one number that is best for people to call? Yeah, it's our 480-359-3998 number. That's a 24-hour line. So, um, you know, they can call anytime. And there's always what's unique, I think, about us is that we always have a nurse, a physician, as well as an admin team that um, is on call. We're not having some answering service that's just going to route your call. Okay. Can you give that number one more time? Because that's a number I don't have, um, and I will add oh. that on to everything. It's 480-359-3998. Wonderful. Well, thank you again so much for your time today. This has uh, really been very informational, and I- I'm very inspired, I- I, you know, with with your belief and your design of your company, um, you, you're you really doing a, a, something very different from many, many other companies out there. And uh, I, I truly do appreciate uh, you looking at how you serve and the depths that you, that you go about. So, again, thank you so much. People can, again, call 480-359-3998. And, of course, for Alzheimer's Speaks, um, visit our main page. That is alzheimerspeaks.com. And if you want to email me, just shoot me an email at radio at alzheimerspeaks.com. We'll talk with you Thursday. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a blessed week. Bye-bye.
Hey everybody, Jared Sebesti, your host of Retire Repurposed. This podcast is dedicated to help people transition into fulfilling and purposeful retirements. Retirement is a big life change. In fact, the two most dangerous years of a person's life are the year they were born and the year they retire. Few people could just flip the switch from working a career 30 or 40 plus years retiring on Friday without methodical steps to living what we call a repurposed retirement. To listen now, search Retire Repurpose on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.